So how does direct sequence code division multiple access work? Well, let's consider sending a digital signal of either plus one or minus one over a time period capital T. And if multiple users, this is multiple access, if multiple users wanted to send at the same time, then unless you do something clever, they will interfere with each other. So what could we do, for example? Well, let's first of all look at the frequency band uh, that we need to use for this signal. So in the Fourier transform uh, of the uh, autocorrelation function, because this will be a random signal, uh, and I'm only showing between 0 and t, but we're thinking of an entire sequence of random data, uh, in which case we need to look at the power spectral density. And for information on that, uh, an autocorrelation function, there's uh, another video on the channel, so check that out. Um, and the power spectral density is, the, uh, is a sinc squared function. So it looks like this. And the crossing points here are 1 on t, uh, 2 on t, uh, and, and 3 on t, and so on. Uh, OK, so this is the bandwidth that's being used uh, to send this signal. Now, something that we could do to try to allow multiple access is we could use what's called direct sequence CDMA. So what we do is we have a sequence, and I'm going to uh, in this case, use an example here of plus one, minus one, uh, and then let's say two plus ones, uh, and then a minus one and a plus one. So this is going to be my sequence for my user, for the signal I want to send. And we're going to multiply the data I want to send by this sequence. So this sequence again, plus one, minus one, plus, plus, minus, plus. So what are we doing now? The signal we're going to send is the multiplication of these two. So in this case, where we're sending a plus one over that time period, it's going to be plus one times this, which will be exactly this sequence. So this is the sequence we'll be sending. Now, let's just look in the frequency domain. What is the Fourier transform now of this sequence, or the, the power spectral density, the power spectral density for this sequence. Well, this is now, in the case I've drawn it, there's one, two, three, four, five, six elements in here. here. So this is now t divided by six in my example here. And we often call this TC, the chip, what we call the chip period. So this is the symbol period, and this is the chip period, TC. And so now we've got something which is six times, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, so now we've got something now which is uh, occupying a bandwidth which is six times the original bandwidth. And so this is means we've spread the spectrum. So sometimes CDMA is called spread spectrum, uh, and that is because we're using more spectrum. So this is one on TC. So this is the price that we're paying to hide our signal from the other users, and we'll see in a second why that is. The price we're paying is that we are using more spectrum. Uh, so it's called spread spectrum. Okay, so what we've done is we've multiplied by this code to send our signal, and in our receiver, let's just think about our receiver for a minute. In our receiver, we know the code for our signal, and so in our receiver, we actually, uh, and it's, uh, it's very much exactly aligned with matched filtering, and there's a video on matched filtering uh, in the description below for more information on that. But in the receiver now, so this has gone into the channel, it's been transmitted, and in the receiver, we're going to multiply again by our sequence. So uh, and we'll see why, uh, just in a minute, why we do that. Okay, so let me do that. In the receiver, we're going to multiply. We receive our signal, and in the receiver, we multiply again. So what we're going to be getting is a multiplication of these here. So let's look at this. This will be plus 1 times plus 1, which will give us plus 1. This is minus times minus, which will give us plus. This will be plus times plus, or plus. And what we can see is if we're multiplying with our sequence, we're always going to be getting a plus. And then we sum them up. Uh, and of course, these are one sixth the energy of the full uh, uh, the full symbol over that time. And so when we sum them up, in this case, we'll be getting plus uh, one, which will correspond to that plus one up there, just scaled by the fact that these were a sixth eighth each. So now we add them up, and it gets a plus one. And this corresponds to us having sent a plus one. If we'd sent a minus one, then we would have sent the 
when we multiply here, we would have sent the opposite of all of these and all of these would have come minus. And when we add them all up, we would have got a minus one. So this is how you send and receive for our own signal. Uh, and of course, though, we have used more bandwidth. And why did we do that? Well, let's think about someone else who sent a signal to us at exactly the same time. So if someone else had sent a signal, and let's say their sequence, I'll just draw it underneath, let's say the sequence they had used to multiply their signal was this one here. So minus, uh, and then a plus with a plus, uh, and then a minus with a minus, uh, and then a plus. So let's say that is, I'll call this sequence one, this is the sequence of our user, and in our receiver, we're going to be multiplying by sequence one. But then there's a sequence from another user, sequence two, and let's say this is what their sequence. So if their sequence was added to the signal that we're receiving, because we've both sent the signals at the same time, then what would we receive from their signal? Well, their signal would go into our receiver and would be multiplying in our receiver by our sequence, because in our receiver we're using our sequence. So what would the outcome be? Well, this is, a, in this case, it's a plus times a minus, so this would give us a minus. Uh, this one here gives a minus times a plus, which would give us a minus. This one gives a plus times a plus, which is a plus. This one, uh, plus minus, which is minus. This one, minus minus, which gives plus. And this one, plus plus, which is a plus. And when we add these together, this gives us zero. There's three minuses and three pluses, it gives us zero. So what we can see is when we add from our own signal, the signal that comes from our own signal with our own sequence, it gives us either a plus one or a minus one. But the signal that comes from someone else's sequence gives us zero. And that would be the same even if you flipped all of these so that if they'd sent the negative of this sequence, because they were sending a negative one, you'd also still get three negatives and three positives, which would give zero. And so their signal is exactly orthogonal to our signal. And you can see uh, this sequence here, what it, it means is, this is where you get the word orthogonal from, this sequence, when you multiply by our sequence, gives you zero. And that's orthogonal sequences, and so both users can transmit at the same time over the same bandwidth. So we're using more bandwidth, but instead of having to use a different frequency range for the other user, all of us are sending over the same frequency range. So we're sending over the same frequency range at the same time, but because we have different codes which are orthogonal, at the receiver, if we use our code, we only get our signal, plus or minus one, and the contribution from the other users will be zero. And likewise, at the other user, they will use their code, and they will get plus and minus ones for their signal, and they will get a zero contribution from our signal. So this is called direct sequence because we're directly multiplying our uh, symbols by our sequences. So what are some of the things we, we need to make sure we have and we know about in order to make this work? Uh, well, first of all, you need your signals. Uh, you need to know what your sequence is at the transmitter and the receiver. And you need, for it to work perfectly, you need the sequences of all the different users to be orthogonal. So that's one thing uh, that happens. And sometimes uh, and often we use pseudo noise sequences uh, for the different users so that the sequences are randomly generated. I've only shown them here with six, but we're going to, in general, use much longer sequences than six, especially if we want more users in the system. Uh, and then the more chips that you have, the shorter the chips is, the more bandwidth that's used, but the more users can be in the system because the more orthogonal codes that you can get. And we often use pseudo noise sequences to get randomized codes uh, which are uh, have a high chance of being orthogonal. Uh, they're not exactly orthogonal, uh, but they have a very high chance. And we can use uh, sh what's called short sequences or long sequences. Uh, short sequences is where you have the sequence, you use the same sequence and repeat it for every symbol that you send, would be called a short sequence. Long sequences, these these uh, randomized codes can be different in the next time slot and the next one and so on, as long as the transmitter knows and the receiver knows uh, exactly what to expect. They can match them up. Um, another thing 
you need to have is that you need to be able to, at the receiver, you need to search to find the start and the end of your symbol. So there's an extra complication here. Of course, normally you need to find where the transition times are, but now we've got more transition times because we're sending with chip rate uh, changes in our signal now. So not only do we need to find where the chip rate changes happen so that we can line them up in our receiver and match up S1 with our expected X S1 in the timing, but we, we, well, we need to know where the chips are, but we also know where to, need to know where the start of the sequence is. So that's an extra thing that we need to do and we use a, a correlator for that. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the sequences are not always orthogonal. With PN sequences, they're close to orthogonal, but especially if you've got a finite set of sequences that you're going to hand out amongst the users, such as in a cellular system, then you can get different sequences in neighboring cells or even cells that are further away than just the near neighbor, but one or two uh, cells away. And those codes can be reused in those cells, but that can cause intercell interference in CDMA, just like normal intercell interference if you have FDMA and uses on different carrier frequencies, for example. So I hope this has helped you to understand how direct sequence works in terms of directly multiplying a sequence by the symbol and how that expands the bandwidth and spreads the spectrum. If you found it helpful, uh, give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Uh, check out the web page in the link below for a full categorized link uh, list of all the videos on the channel and subscribe to the channel for more videos.